Here at First Church, we have a custom of greeting one another in peace by putting our ring finger to our thumb and waving to one another. And so let's wish each other's Christ peace to one another. Our first reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Hear these words from the book that we love. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, and the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went right into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying and the napkin which had been laid on his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to the Father of your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that all the things that she had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And our sermon text comes from Mark's Gospel. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and the Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the very first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been already rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting to the right, sitting to the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised, and he is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled the tomb for terror, and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today's sermon will probably touch some hot buttons that you may feel, and you may disagree with me on many points, and I hope so, I so hope so, because it's always or often the sermons that irritate us, that quicken us, and we revisit in our minds and in conversation later on. So together with the Holy Spirit, may we buckle up. Right now, there are over one and a half million Palestinians displaced. Over 30,000 Palestinians and Jews have been killed in the Gaza Strip right now. Too many times in history, religion and religious people have gotten it wrong. Too, too many wars have been fought in the name of religion. Too often, Christians, we Christians have been quiet or on the wrong side while entire groups have been slaughtered. Some want religion of the state without demanding that that same state make policies based on love, forgiveness, and generosity, which is what our religions are supposed to be about. Some want religion of the state without willingness to do the journey inward that religion requires. All that violence in the name of the God of Abraham, the three groups that claim the God of Abraham are Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And I wonder if we added up all the people who have been lost to war, would we be able to say that our collective group, the children of Abraham, have done far worse to more people than any other belief system. You tell me, have we done a great job representing the God of Abraham? So what now? Now what? Well, over 2,000 years ago, when Jesus walked the earth, he made it clear that God was not interested in becoming the ruler of Rome. God was not interested in raining fire down and killing people who behaved in ways he did not agree. Jesus walked the earth in the Middle East for over 30 plus years and is not reported or recorded as taking the life of one person in the name of the Father. Yet Christians of the state want to take away the rights of women to have authority and autonomy over their own bodies. When the rich man did not choose to follow Jesus, Jesus allowed the young man to go on his way. Jesus allowed people 
to make their own decisions, and yet, Christians of the state want someone else to pray with children in school, but won't sacrifice time to pray with children in their own church. Christians of the state want to influence what doctors and nurses do in hospitals, but will vote for the abolishment of universal health care. So, what now? Will we now return to God for we have gone astray? We will wrap the flag around images of Christ who was about love and not war. And yet say we cannot find a way to love people who are seeking refuge because of money. We say, oh, we, we, just, we just can't afford it. Oh, I guess it's not our problem. So now what? Kenan Clark put out a call to preachers years ago, and I believe it applies to the entire body of Christ today. He said, stop arguing with the saved and start preaching to the lost. The Christ model is for every confessing believer to have a personal relationship with God that includes daily prayer, meditations, reading of scripture, and causes us to be the light of the world. Not follow the world, light up the world. So now, Christians of culture, Christians of the state, are losing societal numbers and are becoming fastly a minority. Will we tighten our grip on the population and will we respond to the shrinking numbers by demanding that people do what we tell them to do? Pro-life, but no free school lunch. Pro-life, but anti-funding for moms to stay home with their children past two, three months, pro-life but anti-affordable childcare for working parents. We won't subsidize the first five years of a child's life, but we're pro-life. We religious people have built a reputation of intolerance and war. So, what now? Is it over? Will the Church of Christ who requests first that we work on personal transformation vanish for a religion that is only associated with oppression and hate? Is that what the future holds? Is that what will happen now? If we look at the history of humanity, we may say yes. To answer what is next for our world, we get a different answer when we look at the history of God. Today I will read a first person account from an eyewitness who was at the resurrection. On a hill far away from me stood an old rugged cross. It was the symbol of suffering and shame. I was there on Friday when the sun refused to shine. I was there the morning the earth shook and the stone was rolled away. The morning of the resurrection is one I will never forget. It was a morning of sweet assurance after something horrible had occurred. You know, there was a feeling of dread building inside of me from the night of the Last Supper all the way to the cross. Silence hung in the air around all of us. I watched as they crucified my Lord. He embodied love and not hate. 
He deserved better. And after my sovereign died, they hurried to observe the religious laws and rules about Passover and the Sabbath. Can you believe it? Running around hurriedly to pay respect, to observe a ritual, to a God, after what just happened to the Son of God? If it's, a, it's as if ritual for religious people can often overshadow reality. We were motionless as they took his body down for burial. Believe you me, I wanted to cry out. But I had to keep my mouth shut. I was already old and hardened by the storms of life and time. The people crucified my Lord and had already disemboweled me. People walked by me every day without regard. In society, I had no voice or value over what they wanted to do with my parts. While I knew what Jesus was, the Son of God, I didn't expect anything. Can you relate? Have you ever gathered because of Jesus but didn't expect anything good to really happen or change? Have you ever gone through the motions of faith without the meaning of faith? That was me. When people got their way and crucified Jesus, we all thought, so what now? Is this the end? Is it over? And I wasn't the only one who witnessed this atrocity. I was not alone. From about noon until 3 p.m., my sibling, the sun, refused to shine. We were all heartbroken. You don't know it, but my siblings, the trees, leaned over, bent with a sorrow at the sight of God, broken and bloodied. Well, on Good Friday, the body of Christ dwelled in a place I could not have imagined. The body of Christ dwelled inside of me, in the very place that was bruised and dug out without regard on the, they put him inside of me. You see, on the morning of the resurrection, the ground did shake, the stone did roll away, the angels did sing, all of heaven praised, and I got to witness, I got to experience what it felt like for creation to hold within the creator. I got to know what it felt like to be smaller than the universe, and yet God of the universe was placed inside of me to hold. I was a tomb when they placed Jesus inside of me. And then, because of the presence of the body of Christ, I became a throne room. I forever am a symbol of triumph. The rock, the rock, was placed inside of a rock. So what now? The answer to what now is in the hands of God. And it's always a wonder beyond comprehension. This God can shrink God's self inside of me and inside of each and every one of you at the same time. The hallelujah of the resurrection isn't just about flesh being reanimated. The hallelujah of the resurrection says that when they hung him high and stretched him wide and he gave up his spirit, he willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed, the hallelujah of the moment is that Easter 
means when the end of something meets the beginning of something else that's better. The end of Christ's physical life on earth met up with the divine work that was yet to come. Oh, we thought, and they thought, that it was over, that we would return to business as usual. But instead, we realized that God was just getting started. I know many of you have observed Lent, and you think it's over. I can go back to chocolate. It's over. But there's an invitation that I hope you hear from my story, that God doesn't just seek to be the God out there, a a, a Bible that we hoive in the air and make other people, other people feel bad about themselves or use it as a billy club to control. But God wants for you to experience what I, the rock, experienced what it feels like for the body of Christ to dwell inside. So what now? We go internal. What now? We go deeper. What now? We become curious. Lord, what will happen if I spend five minutes once a week quiet? What will happen, Lord, if I spend one moment a week speaking with somebody, telling them my story? Internal work is where the future holds. Because when we become strong enough and wise enough internally, then corporately there's no stopping us. But it has to begin on the inside and manifest on the outside. Today, people do pilgrimages to find and touch me. I am the place of triumph. Some say I am a rock. Some say I am a tomb. Some say I am a stone. Who do they say you are? Who do you say you are? Is it a reflection of your internal relationship with God? So now that Jesus has died and rose again, what's next? Will Jesus be your Christ or just your occasional companion? Will you welcome Christ into your inner dwelling as he stands at the door and knocks, hoping that you will open the door and allow him to come in and dwell? Even even now, Jesus is knocking at your door. And if you open the door, he will come in, and he's a good guest. He comes in with all the necessary essentials. Here are some closing words to Ralph and Michelle and anyone who is at the beginning of a journey and has experienced an ending. What's meant for you will always be yours. Now that you have chosen to make commitment official, people may not understand where you are or what you are doing. They may not get your why. You will not be able to control every situation or outcome. But with Christ, you can control yourself. Do good, and good things will come back to you in a myriad of ways. Be happy for what you have while working towards what you want. As a deer panteth by the brook, allow your soul to thirst for Christ and settle for nothing less. Remember the spirit of Easter, which is a time when something must die for something better to begin. You are 
in God's house. God loves imperfect people. Just going to warn you. And if you are rejected, accept it. If you are unloved, let it go. If they choose someone or something instead of you, move on. Christ says to his disciples, if you go into a place, you go into a relationship, you go into a job, you go into a neighborhood, you go into meeting someone and they reject you, they receive you not, wipe the dust off of your feet and allow the blessings of God to return unto you. Not everyone will love you. Everyone didn't love the Messiah. Not everyone you trust will be loyal. Do not follow the majority, follow the Messiah. You, you will feel inside your in, inner sanctuary when someone is not being real with you. But let your light shine. Never regret being authentic. Give people time to get to know you and space to reject you. But don't let anyone bring you so low as to hate. This religion is about love, forgiveness, and self-transformation. May God bless you in your future. Amen, everyone. Happy Easter. God bless you. Most gracious Lord, the places that have been scorched, the places that have been dug up, the places where we feel wounded, the places where we ache for more, come on in and dwell Make what someone meant for selfishness or harm, use it for good. In Jesus' name, amen.